Welcome back to the fifth episode of Mariana Trench or Bust, the series where we try to film the deepest parts of our world's oceans without spending millions of dollars. As you remember from the last episode, we headed out to LA to finally test the drop cam that we've been building. We started off the episode by talking to the founder of Blue Robotics, Rustam, who gave me a few good tips on how to improve the design. Following that, we went to a dock where we were able to test the drop cam down to a depth of 10 meters. Of course, 10 meters is not a significant depth for this device, so it was more just a way of testing that all of the systems work in a real life environment and that the weight release mechanism would dissolve in the approximate time that we expected it to. Finally, towards the end of the episode, we rented a boat and headed out to a point roughly halfway between LA and Catalina Island to drop the drop cam off on its first deployment. And this is where we're gonna pick back up. Initially, everything seemed to be fine as the drop cam descended. Of course, one of the cameras wasn't working as we diagnosed in the previous episode, so we've only got half of the 360 field of view, which, for our purposes here today, is fine. But as the drop cam descended, something pretty unexpected happened. The drop cam came up way faster than I expected it would. I think this probably has something to do with the salt releases getting dissolved faster as it's going down through the bottom column. So maybe the salt releases are not going to be the best option for us. Sure enough, the salt release, which was supposed to take 20 to 30 minutes to dissolve, and which we tested on the day before, dissolved in less than five, which meant that the drop cam released its weight and began its trip back to the surface before it even reached the seabed. Looks like one salt release was not strong enough to support the excess weight from that very heavy weight. So I've fastened two salt releases this time and that should be strong enough. At this point, I thought that adding additional releases would help slow down the dissolving process and allow the drop cam to finally get down to the seabed. Unfortunately, that was not the case, and in this second attempt, the releases dissolved faster than the drop cam descended down, and we never got a chance to take a look at the seabed. We've run out of weights to attach to the drop cams because I did not expect us to need more than, well, three releases. Let's make our way back. Let's get the footage off of the SD cards, and I am really really hoping that we do have some footage from the seabed otherwise this would have been a little bit of a waste as we headed back into shore we had a chance to reflect on what went wrong and how to fix it but before turning in for good we had one more item on the agenda one last thing I want to do before we head back in for good is just to try out how well that beacon is visible in the water. It's past sunset already, so what I'm going to do is drop the drop cam in the water and then measure how far we can get while still seeing the beacon. 
we're about 500 or so meters away and you can see it intermittently just over there. The foam blocks are blocking it half the time. That's about what I expected. Overall, I'm not really sure if today was a success. I'll know for sure once I pull the video off of the SD cards. My main concern is that the salt releases dissolved way quicker than we anticipated, and that may mean that the uh, weights were disconnected before the drop cam even hit the seabed. That would of course be kind of annoying, we wouldn't get any nice footage. My guess as to why the salt releases activated sooner than expected was because uh, while the drop cam is descending down the water column, all of that fresh water and the current that's going along the surface of the releases means that the salt dissolves a lot quicker. So what we could do is either make some sort of shroud for the release to protect it from that current, uh, or we could use a larger salt block so that it takes longer for it to work its way through to the point where it breaks. Apart from that, one more thing that I really need to work on is to make the drop cam easier to deploy. Uh, today, I was getting really, really seasick while trying to get it set up. Uh, all of those little screws to put in are really quite annoying, especially when it's pretty wavy out. What I'm hoping for would be to make a one button operation. That way I can turn it on and activate the delay all from the outside of the drop cam. Unfortunately, things did not go as expected yesterday. When I recovered the footage from the SD cards, uh, I could see that the drop cam descended for about a minute or two before the salt release activated, uh, which is way too early. It did not get even close to the seabed. So here I am on the following day. Unfortunately, cameraman Gnome had to fly out. So I'm alone, but that's okay. Today, I'll be testing the smaller of the two drop cams. So I am packing a little bit lighter, uh, but I really don't want to leave LA empty-handed, so hopefully I'll get some footage at least from that one. Now for a bit of context, here I said the smaller of two drop cams, and so far in this series we've only been building one. Well, many years ago, back when I worked at Blue Robotics, I worked on a project to develop a smaller drop cam, a more simple, more affordable version of what I'm building here. Although the goals of that one were very different from the one we're building here, it still uses many interchangeable components and I wanted to test out the salt releases a little bit more, so I decided to bring it out and test it here on the second day. I've just crossed the 800 meter line on my map, so I'll get the draw cam ready and deploy it. And one more thing I did get is some of this paint. Hopefully, we'll be able to attract some creatures with it. I've strapped one of the squids to the outside and I've put one in the weight bag as well. So this time I have attached three of these salt releases and I have got some electrical tape around them to hopefully slow down the dissolving process. I've also cut the electrical tape up so that it doesn't hold it up once the salt is dissolved. Okay, that's recording. Thankfully, no issues with it this time. That weight release is on. And off it goes. In contrast to the main full ocean depth drop cam that we're building, this simpler, shallower version has much thinner viewing ports, which is why the image quality is a lot better. Additionally, both of the camera lenses are working here, so this is what the footage is supposed to look like. Everything seems to be going well up until this point. The floodlights suddenly turn up to full brightness and then turn off altogether. The camera, however, stays recording as we can see the reflection of the timestamp on the onboard display. About a minute or so later, we can hear a distinct click. This is most likely the sound of the drop cam impacting the seabed, as it is roughly when we would expect it to take place. 
Quite annoyingly, since the lights have failed, the only thing we can actually see at this point is the reflection of the camera recording light, so we don't get any interesting footage. The drop cam then proceeds to return back to the surface. Unfortunately, we've had a failure, so the drop cam returned back to the surface pretty quick, but once I opened it, I noticed that there was actually water inside the battery bay. That is not good. Another day, another failure, but with these sort of things, there's always bound to be setbacks. There was, however, a silver lining about this specific deployment. The drop cam did get down to the seabed, and it did record a video. It just didn't have any lights. Unfortunately, that is not how I expected the video to end. I really hoped we would get some footage from 800 or 1000 meters, but unfortunately all of the drops ended up in failures or partial failures. The good thing is that I did receive, uh, I did get all of the drop cams back, they didn't crush and we didn't lose them, so I am able to analyze what went wrong. For the last drop, I can see that the lights got flooded and then the water made its way through the cable into the main battery housing. Thankfully, the camera itself was unaffected, it was in a separate housing so it kept on recording. I doubt we're gonna get any good footage from it though, just because the lights were off, so it's most likely gonna be a black screen. Looking towards the future, I now know what we need to fix, however. The salt releases need to be replaced with a different type of salt or perhaps different chemical that dissolves more slowly. The housing for the main drop cam needs to be readjusted and remade just because it's proving to be too difficult to assemble, especially while the boat is rocking. And of course, the electronics need to be fixed as well. Uh, three main things that'll hopefully make life easier in the future. Armed with this valuable real-life experience, I headed back to Philadelphia knowing exactly what I need to do to make this work. I've returned back to the studio, which means that we can do some proper testing and hopefully figure out a solution to the salt problem. In all of the testing that I did prior to the main deployment, I had the water in a stationary position. There was no current rushing past the salt releases. And to be honest, this is a pretty obvious thing that I should have realized earlier, but just like your sugar in a teacup, if you swirl it around, it'll dissolve way quicker. Same goes for the salt releases. So most likely salt is not gonna be the best way to uh, achieve our goals. On the flight back, I had to think about alternative methods and I realized that there's a number of dissolving filaments for 3D printers available. A few years ago, I did experiment with PVA filament, but found that any sort of designs for releases using PVA dissolved way too slowly, so it would take days for it to properly release. But recently, I found that there is this filament called BVOH, and it functions in the same way as any other dissolving filament, but it is way quicker, so I've got pretty high hopes for this. I think it should be possible to make a very reliable release that can dissolve at a fairly precise time. In order to prove the concept of the dissolving filament release, I made a quick prototype here. So as you can see, the top and the bottom parts, they're going to be made out of a non-dissolving filament. So whenever the middle part, which is made out of the dissolving one, dissolves away, it's going to sever that linkage and release the weight. The really good thing about this design is I can very easily change the surface area of the dissolving part and thereby change the dissolving speed. So as you can see, I've got these little spokes that are easily adjustable, so the more there are, the greater the surface area. I've exported the design into my 3D printing software, so let's set it to print and try it out. While those releases are getting printed, I wanted to take a closer look at these lights and figure out what went wrong. After a closer inspection, I noticed that one of the O-rings was a little bit damaged and that most likely caused the leak. Although we're not going to be using this type of lights on our main drop cam, it's still important to understand why things fail.
These turned out pretty nicely. Now, I just need to set up the aquarium with the weight release mechanism, and also I'll be putting a water pump in there to make sure that the water is circulating. That way, we can get a more realistic release time. I made a few different versions here that have a different number of cutouts. Since greater amount of cutouts means more surface area, we should be seeing those dissolving a lot faster. I've conducted a number of different tests with these releases and so far I'm pretty happy with the way they're turning out. I tried them out in still water, I've tried them out in moving water, so that's when the aquarium has the water pump, and finally I've also tried them with cold water. Uh, since the depths that we would be going to uh, have near freezing water, I did fill this aquarium up with some ice uh, in the water just to see how that changes the rate of dissolving, and it is a pretty big effect. One more thing I certainly need to do is do a salt water test. I don't anticipate that the salt content of the water will greatly impact the dissolving rate of the BVOH material, but that is definitely something we need to find out, as that is the only difference between this and a real-life environment. I'm really happy with the way it's turning out, so I think this is the solution that I'm going to be using for the next field test. It's a shame that I didn't think of it earlier, because it's way easier than using the salt releases, and it's super customizable, so I can tailor it exactly for our needs. Now that the issues with the dissolving salt linkage are pretty much fixed, we've only got two other major issues to solve before trying it out in the field again. Those are the camera system problems, and also the overall difficulty of using the device. I think this is going to be about it for this episode, so I'll see you next time where we hopefully fix those problems.